Hello, everybody. Welcome to the panel on Thai politics. Um, welcome to the speakers. Uh, unfortunately, I just heard that uh, one of the speakers that was announced, uh, Ms. Chalini Sonplai, is not able to attend, so um, I apologize for her. Uh, but we have two excellent uh, panelists here with um, Adzan Vasin and with Supinya, so thank you very much. Uh, the topic of this panel is Thai politics and how it's related to hate speech. Um, and uh, I think, Supinya, uh, you just told me that you pr prepared a presentation on that topic, and uh, I would invite you to, to show it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frederick, and uh, good morning, uh, all the um, distinguished guests, organizers, and panelists, and hello to everyone who uh, watching this online as well. Uh, I may have to wear this because it's a bit far away. Um, uh, I prepare some notes uh, uh, for my presentation and maybe just to open this uh, for discussion. Okay, the topic is hate speech and conflict in Thai democracy. So may I may I uh, give you some brief background about politics and media landscape which related to uh, what so called hate speech, and uh, and I will try to give solution as uh, many people said earlier that we need to hear a solution of the topic. Oh, <laughs> it's it's too small. Uh, that's the matter. So I began with uh, yesterday incidents. We should commemorate the October 6, 1976 incidents. But many people say that we should not call October 6 incident. We should call Thomasat Maska. This is a debate on Twitter uh, yesterday that uh, from the young generation that they are more concerned about uh, October 6 incident more, and they calling uh, uh, for the public uh, to remember this event as a Thammasat massacre because it's more clear rather than just cause October 6 incident because it's very blurry and it created euphoria that people don't understand what exactly happened. Uh, so I mentioned about October 6 because we are having seminar today uh, uh, at Thomasite University. There was a place that there's a massacre happened 44 years ago and that incident referred to uh, hate speech produced by the authoritarian regime and the pro-government uh, at the time accusing the student and the protester uh, as a a threat against national uh, security or uh, being a communist, etc. Because at the time, uh, there was the time uh, during the Cold War as well. I assume you know about the incident of October 6 already, but um, yeah, it's good we are here today and to commemorate and to remember what happened. Uh, and it's not written in the Thai history properly and uh, people don't understand. But uh, the issue of October 6, uh, October 6 now being discussed widely on the internet. And every time when people talking about hate speech in Thailand related to politics, people always refer to the October 6 from 1976 or another uh, call as a Thamasat Maska because there are many students being killed uh, in front of uh, the, this area that you already know. Uh, so I mentioned this because we'd like to link to the situation right now. After 1976, we've gone through a lot of political uh, turmoil. There are many military coups, uh, but there is a golden time of the media democratization uh, after uprising in 1992 and led to the constitution of 1997. Uh, but then again, I want to jump to the situation right now that um, uh, people talking about hate speed, uh, my point is, uh, hate speed actually being uh, produced, reproduced by media from time to time. I mentioned about October 6, 1976, but there's another incident uh, during, uh, during uh, the conflict 
between Thai people, between uh, polarization between red shirt and yellow shirt. At the time, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, there are a lot of uh, has his speech produced uh, on the national TV and community radios uh, from both sides attacking each other. And I think it's a very unique incident in Thailand because we have a television that broadcasts the mass protest 24 7 and they are allowed to say everything. So that another phenomenon of the popular hate speech produced by uh, by social movement from both sides. And it set the standard that you can say anything broadcasting online 24 seven, accusing anyone and using strong and aggressive words. Uh, that become the incident during the uh, ongoing conflict in Thailand. Uh, until that the recent coup, uh, the recent coup uh, uh, after the coup in, uh, I think 2014, uh, right? Uh, uh, yes, uh, the military shut down all, all those satellite and community radio. I was working as an NBTC commissioner at the time. So the situation contrasts completely overnight. After 24 7 of broadcasting anything, including his speech or, uh, on TV and radio, the overnight after the coup all are completely shut down. <laughs> all those uh, color code that uh, uh, satellite TV or, or radio. So um, uh, uh, I would like to say that how hate speech is being taken in, in Thailand, um, there's no legal uh, jurisdiction against this. I, as I told you 10 years ago, you can say anything on TV and we don't have a direct law to regulate hate speech, but we have other law under criminal courts, just like the defamation law, less majesty law, computer crime act that many times being used by uh, the authority or by uh, political group against the dissident or the critics. Uh, so that's why the term hate speech is similar to the term fake news in Thailand. Of course, we don't support hate speech, but many times uh, hate speech currently being used by uh, the people who don't agree with uh, the voice of the dissidents and they try to say that uh, the dissidents are, are producing a lot of hate speech, but actually also true because now the debate jump from TV and radio to online on Twitter and social media and a lot of his being there. Uh, but again, it's complex when you are raising this term in among Thai politics because uh, because you know because of ongoing polar polarization for a long time and hate speech that done by the authority and by the government in the past, uh, they are not uh, 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 People seem to not care about it, but at uh, this time when hate speech growing, uh, being produced by the popular movement or by the dissident, uh, many people seem to care about it. So that's why uh, when you really talk about hate speech, there are different ideas among public in Thailand. So it's very difficult to find a common ground uh, because it sometimes it become a, a shield or it become a, a something against each other. So uh, when, for example, when another group demanding the young generation that you should not produce hate speed, the young generation will fight back with, you also produce hate speed in the past uh, when you fight against uh, uh, Thaksin Shinawatra government or during 19 October, uh, during October 6, 1976, you also have a lot of hate speed against students. So people keep debating about this and finally it's very hard to find a solution then what should be a solution uh, uh, in Thailand. Uh, so my point is from propaganda by state on media to UGC, everyone know UGC, right? UGC means user generated content. <laughs> so uh, from state owned media in 1976, that being used as a weapons against the student uh, 44 years ago. Now we move to UGC, with, which is mean user generated content via social media, which a lot of has speed as well. So my question is, uh, Frederick asked me what he should ask me now. I think I should ask you and everyone, how should we handle his speed in this era? In this era? Because from 1976 to 2020, the situation seems different and there's various uh, uh, factors. Of course, there are role of social media and now uh, not only state owned media or not only the mass media are handling or responsible or accountable for speech or his speech, but 
everyone, we all are using uh, media to produce uh, free speed or hate speed or love speed. So, so as Frederick said, or uh, as Pia said, how to balance between allowing freedom of expression, but at the same time, not led to the violence. I think this is a complex and difficult issue. So one point that uh, we are concerned is there's a, there's a gap between uh, digital natives and digital immigrants, and we should mind that gap. Uh, sometimes the definition of hate speech uh, between the older generation and young generation might be different because of the culture change. Uh, I don't have time to go into detail, but maybe I come back later. But what should we do then? I think, uh, I, I really don't see it because it's too small, but I remember it, so maybe you read it. What should we do? What should be a solution? For me personally, I think we should focus on fact-checking first, not because I'm doing work on fact-checking on COFAC right now, which I'm speak later, but more of hate speech come from foul information or fake news. Uh, and fake news, this and misinformation always lead to hate speech. And it, I think 7 to 80% in political issue, I don't have research to, uh, to verify that, but uh, many times it comes from uh, a misunderstanding and it led people to, uh, to hate each other. So I think in order to fight against hate speech, we should focus much more on fact checking on both sides, even though we disagree, but we should respect fact. And in order to have fact, we should have a collaborative approach because there is no single truth. We should allow everyone to seek the fact and those facts uh, a series of fact can could develop to truth, and when we understand that fact and truth properly, it could reduce our uh, hate. And and beyond that, I think uh, rather than using authoritarian approach by uh, suppress, suppressing speech by using criminal laws, which never work in Thailand and always backfired and intensify conflict, I think we should rather change approach. Uh, uh, by focusing on empowering what called digital citizenship and digital intelligence, which means you still uphold basic right and freedom, but at the same time, you encourage a digital citizen to uh, uh, to have more responsibility as uh, as well as the right. Uh, and you should encourage more uh, for people, both older and younger generation, to develop what called digital intelligence. It means ability to use uh, the digital platform, but at the same time, ability to understand and respect oneself and the others. Uh, or you could call empathy, or you could call compassion, or whatever. So humanity, or you, you would say that. Uh, you should, uh, I think this is another approach that we should develop together with uh, support uh, promoting based on fact checking and also encourage for uh, digital intelligence and uh, empowerment for the digital uh, censorship. And uh, moreover, uh, I think uh, we should support uh, journalism without fear of favor. This is the theme uh, for you from UNESCO today on World Press Freedom Day. I think good journalism will help uh, in preventing conflict from hate speech and based on fact checking and without fear of favor. That, uh, and I would address again that real fact matter. In many cases, fact could prevent hate. Uh, because many times misunderstanding with this and misinformation also called fake news lead to his speech. Last year, we organized Digital Thinker Forum, which are supported by uh, HD through uh, a Swiss Embassy and British Norman uh, Foundation, which also co-hosting this event. We conduct a forum called Humanity in Digital Age, because we also want to counter his speech, but rather than uh, supporting the measure to suppr suppress speech. We still think that we should encourage more humanity in digital aid. And uh, Ajahn Vasin, our speaker, sit next to me also join. I don't, I, I don't say what he said because he's gonna say himself today. So at the end of my presentation, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, last year I, I was on the trip in Germany on the 
uh, IAF Academy and I met with many friends from many countries and I heard the story from Turkey. Uh, that's interesting because in Turkish uh, politics, you know that maybe compared to Thailand, it's a lot of tension, uh, it's a lot of hate and it's a lot of pluralization. Uh, and there's a fighting between the uh, leading government, uh, President Erdogan, and also the opposition party. And I think both sides always, um, uh, the supporter of both sides always hate each other. But what I learned from friends in the workshop last year and and about the book, this is the book, uh, the book of radical love, because uh, the opposition party in Turkey last year, they changed the strategy. Uh, uh, so they call radical love. They said that you can still hate uh, uh, Erdogan, but you should not hate his supporters uh, because uh, people might have dream and passion and some belief. And uh, we should not use the same measure uh, that what they use that hate against that. And we still disagree with them. Maybe we still hate their leaders, but we should not hate their supporters. And I think their strategies became successful but for the local election. But the critics said that, let's see for this strategy in the coming presidential election in 20, uh, 2023 in Turkey. I think I was inspired uh, by this example, uh, even though, of course, politics in Tur Turkish politics still, uh, still um, are tough as Thailand, but uh, maybe a successful story, even small, uh, could inspire us on how we could handle uh, his speech, especially in the country uh, like Thailand and in Asia. The concept of radical love maybe could compare to what uh, touch in Buddhism but I don't have time to go in detail, but this is in Turkey, uh, that's Islam uh, country. Uh, so at the end, <laughs> uh, this is my current work right now. This is cofact.org from, it come from collaborative fact checking. We believe that if people respect fact, it will prevent hate speech. So I would like to quote Audrey Tang, digital minister from Taiwan. Uh, uh, she said in the international fake news conference last year, about uh, one uh, about blind trust is worse than no trust because many times blind trust lead to hate speech and lead to violence because people believe in something that nonsense and something that maybe is not logical at all. Uh, so, uh, in order to counter hate speech, we should focus on the fact. And if finally you cannot trust anything at all, rather than not trust better than you have a blind class because that could lead to hate speech and could lead to violence. That's uh, uh, anyone, we don't want that to see. That's all, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Supinya, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, you made a short um, journey into the history and about uh, the conflict rich uh, history uh, in Thailand, and uh, but then you also uh, went into the present and uh, said that there are some uh, legal issues. Um, everybody in Thailand has its own definition of hate speech, unfortunately, and sometimes the definition of hate speech, hate speech is used to um, criminally um, or use the law against dissidents. Um, and uh, you were asking or you were demanding for more digital literacy among citizens uh, and to fact check news um, thank you very much. Uh, are there already some questions now to Supinya? Um, if not, well, okay. Um, well, I, I would have a question uh, to Supinya. Um, you said that, you know, history in Thailand was all, always kind of very dense and um, sometimes even violent. Um, how, when it comes to the political dialogue and uh, the way people talk to each other, uh, how would you describe the situation right now? Has it been, has it become more aggressive due to uh, social media? Um, do you see any trends uh, that uh, social media is kind of facilitating the polarization of the society? Uh, yes, of course, but uh, I would like to point out that what happened in 1976 at the time there was no social media, but there's a uh, intensive uh, hate speech and propaganda through TV and radio, and it led to real violence, the killings. 
uh, compared to now, many people uh, observe that social media intensify and amplify hate speech, and it's true because it's keep wiring, it multiplying. You keep seeing it, uh, but somehow many people observe that that allow people to express, and then when you really express uh, totally or fully, maybe you are too tired to really going to kill each other. Or my point is, hate speech is not it is should not be encouraged, but when hate speech uh constructed by people who have power is more dangerous than um, general public but of course we should not support both and i agree that uh, social media platforms should play a role in doing this but in order to doing this in country in asia like thailand uh, mostly they would collaborate with the government and that would be dangerous and scary. Uh, how could we enforce rule of law and government into the process that would be the more uh, important. So that's why in my slide presentation as well, uh, young generation, they rather trust uh, Facebook rather Thai government, even though they know that Facebook also violating their right and freedom. And why is that? Uh, it should be otherwise compared to what happened in European countries. So in America, people now more criticizing again, big tech because they uh, supporting fake news and hate speech, but in Thailand, uh, for some general, for the current debate, uh, political debate right now, people rely on social media uh, to fight against the government and the power that be, and of course a lot of hate speech, a lot of things being done. My idea, I think that uh, social media should play a platform, uh, should play a role in doing something, but they should do based on collaborative approach rather than just collaborating merely with the government because that would lead to another consequence. And at the same time, we should work with the leader of political camps like what happened in the Turkish. If the leader of opposition party or the government party come to say that you can hate us, but don't hate our supporters, that would be a good sign. So I mean, there should be yeah. Sometimes there's a checks and balance in the uh, in the debate in the social media that uh, between the dissident and opposition uh, group among themselves when it's gone too far, but uh, still it could be intensified and push. We should not ignore that. My my uh, I I think we should do something, but in order to do something, we have to think clearly and we should have good strategy and we should uh, be more collaborative in doing that. Thank you very much. Um, so as we talk about already about the um, political present right now in Thailand, um, Adzan Vasin has uh, done some academic work on the current um, or possible generation conflict or is, is, there, is there a generational conflict right now in the Thai society and do they use hate speech or not? So um, Adzan Vasin has done some academic work on that and um, I would invite him, I would like to invite him to present his ideas. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, Kun Frederick, and good morning, everyone, um, and dear panelists too. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here discussing about um, hate speech in uh, Thailand. Um, for my presentation, I will present a you know particular angle of hate speech, which I and Ajahn Shalini, who is not here, um, call like you know, intergenerational hate speech. I think this is a new trend of hate speech in Thailand. Um, I think that we now see that generation has become an object of hate speech. Um, also, in my presentation, I will address the issue um, that Kun Supinya already touched upon briefly, which is digital natives and digital um, immigrants, and how you know the intergeneral, oh, sorry, intergenerational misunderstanding leads to you know the exacerbation of you know um, the co political conflict in in Thailand. Um, also, what I will present is like you know my preliminary observation. So I will very much welcome, you know, comments and, you know, and insights from panelists and from um, everyone here so I can, you know, improve my, my research. Um, so first of all, let me begin by providing, you know, a 
general context of um, like, you know, the current political conflict in Thailand, focusing particularly on the intergenerational um, you know, conflict. So as, as the post-coup political conflicts erupted yet again, Thailand social media spaces have been filled with online hate speech. However, this is not the first time that hate speech has strong implications um, in Thai politics, as Khun Supinya said in the 1970s, when student massacre of October the 6th happened. At that time, um, student activists were called by many derogatory terms, and that really led to like physical violence and, and killing. So you see that, you know, hate speech really, really um, had an impact upon, like, you know, um, the dynamics of political conflict at that time. And likewise, this time it also, like, you know, um, impacts, like, you know, upon, like, the, the, the ongoing conflict. However, what has changed this time is the intergenerational um, politics, which shapes how hate speech is uttered in the online spheres, be it Facebook, Twitter, Line, even YouTube. Um, okay, in my presentation, I will try to understand, you know, to try to point out the dynamic changes of online hate speech in the context of post coup political conflicts in Thailand. Um, the emerging intergenerational cleavages that have defined the new round of political conflicts in um, Thailand are recentering the focus of conservative establishments, like you know the military and um, other, like you know conservative like cliques. The military and the pro Palang Prachat cliques are now accusing that student protesters are manipulated by the move forward and pro Thaksin Pertain. And also, the hyper royalist group in particular has expressed like, you know, certain kind of abomination towards student leaders. And students are being called by several dehumanizing and derogatory terms. I won't mention those terms, but but I think I, I assume that you like follow the news and you know that, and these terms are you know seen like you know in like you know online spaces in particular, and at the same time like, to to provide a balanced and fair analysis, there are terms used by like the young to criticize the older generation as well. You know in particularly those who are in the conservative establishments. So in this case, we see that, you know, both like, you know, the size, like, you know, like the young and the older generation, they have like, you know, terms to call each other. And, and those terms can be derogatory terms and, you know, can be considered at hate, as like hate speech. So in Thailand, in short, a new version of hate speech is taking shape and this time it unfolds in the form of intergenerational hate speech. And it is worth noting that hate speech should be understood in a political context within which it occurs. I, by this, I mean that, you know, when we, um, when we try to define hate speech, we have to take into account, you know, the, the cultural and political context of that, uh, of the place that you um, are in too, because like, you know, there are like certain elements like between like um, the derogatory terms and, you know, and kind of the um, cultural and political underpinnings. Okay. Um, in other places, like, you know, there is gendered, racial or xenophobic hate speech. We see this in like, you know, the European context. In the case of Thailand, it is politically influenced intergenerational hate speech. And um, so my main point here is to bring into the light um, the spread of online intergenerational hate speech, and which is the issue that receives like limited attention in contemporary, like, you know, academic debate. And I aim to highlight, you know, both drivers and dynamics of the current, like, you know, depressing trend in, in Thailand. Um, so let's first examine the drivers and, and the dynamics. Um, the first drivers, um, 
the first driver here is like you know the political context which Kun Sufinya also um, highlighted. Now in Thailand we are in a deeply polarized like you know um, in deeply polarized uh, politics. Um, initially the dynamics of political conflict was shaped by the struggles between the pro taxin red shirt and the pro monarchy yellow shirt. However, there is a qualitative shift in these dynamics, transforming the struggles into, like you know, the dissolved um, future forward-led cliques and pro uh, Palang Prasharat parties. As you can see, the young, like you know, in general support, like you know, um, the future forward, whilst the older generation remains a strong supporter of the current regime. Um, however, like, you know, there are like certain, um, I mean, there are like, you know, people like with different generation who support like, you know, different um, political ideologies, but this is just to provide, like, you know, a, a, an overview. So, um, as I say, like in, in reality, like, you know, there are, there are like, you know, um, more varieties. As you can see, um, that this shift really um, shapes how hate speech in, in Thailand is like expressed. So that's the first driver. The second driver is that the young are now explicitly expressing their great concerns about the accountability and legitimacy of um, the current government. Um, there are terms and jargons that are used by the young to communicate with the public, which are definitely not hate speech. However, this is something like culturally unacceptable to the older generation who demands like respect from, from children. And I think this mismatch in the cultural perception of respect further, like, you know, um, worsens the intergenerational um, conflict. The third driver is that online spaces have become a prominent um, channel through which the young engage in political discussions. Um, Facebook pages and Twitters can be seen as like you know, a channel that helps release like you know disappointment, hopelessness, grievances, and and deprivation of the young. Anonymity remains important, and social media can provide this and this. Um, leads to my fourth point. It's in, in political science, we now um, talk about affective politics. The, we try to examine the role of affect in, you know, in mass mobilization, in political protest. And we, in general, find that affect can, you know, worsen polarization in pol politics. But I think that is something that that's, um, understandable. Um, finally, the, the last driver that I want to highlight here is that in general, there is clearly a lack of awareness about hate speech. Um, in Thailand, in, in that Thailand has not yet come to terms with, you know, the violent past, which partly like, you know, ignited by, by hate speech and unable, unable to come to terms with the past, like, you know, um, is seen as like you know the obstacle to um, to kind of move forward out move forward like you know from the from the existing or the ongoing political conflict. Um, my next point here is to um, underscore like some like insidious effects like you know that we might um, encounter like you know with the spread of of hate speech. Um, so intergenerational hate speech poses like a plethora of problems for Thai society as follows. First, it allows like politically permissible hate speech against those who are like pro taxin and the, the young vis-a-vis -vis the conservative. For instance, the rubbish collection organization like, you know, is relatively free to fish hunt people and throw hate speech on them. And I think like if you want to know more, you can examine me like, you know, um, the um, the, best, the the official Facebook page of this particular organization. Um, secondly, I think the like, political correctness is defined by the conservative meta narrative. 
And moreover, we have seen the normalization of hate speech, hate speech against those who criticize, like, you know, the certain um, conservative establishment. And it festers the culture of um, hate. And in this context, like certain political figures reap the benefit of being an ally of the regime to legitimately demonize, like, you know, um, like, you know, um, like the opposition, particularly like Mr. Taksin Chinomatra and, and then his sister, like um, ex Prime Minister, Prime Minister Ying Lak Chinomatra. And third, um, repetitive online bullying is spreading, and this will worsen the situation and drag the political conflict, like you know, onwards to the point at which physical violence um, grows inevitable. And I think we we. Um, we can learn this from our historical experience. Um, my final remark here is that is to like try to to find like you know a way to deal with with this particular um, situation and problem. Um, I think that there are like proponents of legal regulation, like you know who contend that. Um, threatening words and materials should be prohibited because they overstep the mark of acceptable boundaries of freedom of expression and generate a climate of fear within a culture of hate. But in the context of Thailand, in which the boundary of freedom of expression is already like limited, like you know, I just want to pose a question here, a question here that how how can we move on with that? And this is like an open-ended question, and I really. I really don't have like you know a, a clear answer, but I think I can find like you know some answers from here. So that's my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Arjun Masin. Uh, are there any questions? Um, yeah, there is already a question. Please. The, you know, freedom of speech. So how would we, you know, uh, look at the phenomenon of hate speech? This should be very different from other Western countries, right? So I don't know how, what is your opinion about this uh, aspect of the phenomenon of hate speech? And my second question is to Ajahn Vasin. Um, I'm now working on the pejorative language uh, in hate speech as well. And I'm very interested in what you said that um, it's because of derogatory words that are used in hate speech that cause the problems. Now, but what I see is there are so many, you know, many kinds of speech that are used um, as hate speech in Thailand, but they are poetic language. And very interesting, like the word Napandin is the po patriotic song. And there is nothing derogatory in, in this phrase. So I really, you know, wondering how, how you would explain this kind of, uh, um, you know, it's puzzling for me. Okay, thank you. I think the first question was to you, Supinya. Hello, okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with what your statement said. So that's why when I have to do presentation to talk about this, it took me a long time because you cannot just uh, say it briefly in one word because uh, as you said, right, yes, Atayla always have difficulty in enjoying what called free speech for all along. And in the past, I think 30 years ago or 20, uh, after 1992, after 1992 uprising, I think at the time, uh, most of civil society still have common idea because the political reform and media reform after 1992 uprising or post we still share common ideas against uh, what called liberty or freedom because at the time, both uh, 
we are fighting against a military regime similar to uh, 14 October in 1973. But currently, after the uh, two, uh, two coup, uh, the polarization, people think about uh, liberty, different free speech has hate speech totally different. When you're talking about media reform, uh, media uh, or speech, uh, people would think different. Like for example, uh, younger generation would complain that we don't really enjoy free speech at all. Why the conservative and older generation will say that, oh my God, there's too much speech in this country and we can bear it it's too much and it's harmful. It would be totally different idea. Uh, so, uh, and then when people have two different ideas about what consider free speech, how you could find a common ground when you want to deal with that, that difficult and what, what just you said. So in order to find a loose solution, uh, uh, we need it, but the approach would be different from what happened in the uh, European or in the Western country that I would agree. But somehow we should rely on universal concept, uh, but uh, the approach uh, might be different because when uh, we act, like I just said before, we need social media platform like Facebook, Twitter to do something. But when it happened in country in Asia like Thailand, it tend to be manipulated by people who have powers because we don't have full rule of law or what, whatever it said. So it's so it related to democratization, check and balances and that. So, ra, so at the end, people don't want any regulation <laughs> because people just, you know, like NBTC, I work with NBTC for almost six years and we have to make a decision against TV content. And many times NBTC just punish uh, a TV station that consider a dissident or entire government and saying that they produce hate speech or bias. But at the same time, they did nothing against the pro uh, government. Uh, TV, for example. So various double standards become a problem. And when you're talking about solution to hate speed, it never find a common ground. And sometimes people uh, defend it. Uh, and may I Kunmasin, will answer you about the language. That is true. Many words in, in Thailand right now, like Salim, Ting uh, Som, uh, there's no aggressive. There's no <laughs> but when it reproduce, reproduce, it could be considered hate speech as well. But you will think that, of course, but why not? As long as it's not just, uh, it's still not an aggressive word, as long as you still respond. But it's, it's complex. Language is very important, but the context also relevant. But at the same time, again, if you produce it, reproduce, reproduce too much, even a simple word, it could mean, uh, a weapon as well. Uh, of course, we should not encourage it, but again, we should not criminalizing it. That that's my point. That my stand that I could say it right now. Yeah. Yeah, actually, like I I agree with with I I think in order to study those words, first of all, we have to understand like you know the cultural and political context. So we can first of all examine like you know then what like, you know, postmodernists call, like, you know, the meta narrative that um, drives, like, you know, the society, you know, and I think, like, doing that can be, like, you know, the first step to understand, like, you know, the kind of the discursive context. And then you can, like, you know, put those words or terms in, into, like, you know, context. And, as you as like you know everyone knows like there are like you know polite terms that eventually when used by like you know um used a lot by protesters or some people like and th that term becomes like you know a kind of um hidden like you know um derogatory term so my my point here is just that we have to be sensitive to to like the cultural context and and also we have to look closely into like, you know, culturally bound political jargon and like, you know, the term like Salim and stuff. And I like, you know, I, and recently I have just learned, like, you know, another um, language, which is like Pasalu, Pasalu or Lu language. This has been used widely by like, you know, um, the younger generation. I still don't um, 
I mean, like, I'm still like at the beginner level, so I don't understand like very much. But I know that like um, it's kind of a parallel language, and you know they can use like you know they can turn like you know Thai language into like Pasa Lu like Lu language, and you Lu it's Lo Ling so Lo U it's just no no it's Lu in Thai it doesn't particularly like you know have like a meaning right <laughs> have you heard of a salu <laughs> they use it in the mob and i think that they can use like you know thai word and turn it into like lu language and they can turn like head speech like like you know or direct derogatory term like you know into lu language it's still like you know um, it can still consider like head speech but sometimes not so there there, there are is always like you know a blurring line here but what we can do is like try try is like um trying to um contextualize like you know those words yeah. um i i also yeah please i have one more question and then yes See the conflict there, even in, in intra generation, not intergeneration. Yeah, I, I think like intra and intergenerational conflict, like you know, um occurs like um in parallel however um i think that what is more explicit right now like um from based on like some studies and of course my own we um we have seen like you know um a shift uh from like you know um ideological polarization to like you know inter um generational like fragmentations so that's that's kind of you know um what like um the new trend in in the conflict so yeah spoke with one of the students who are interesting uh, she is a doctor student but she uh, she with uh, she disagree with the uh, the movement student movement, but she said she rather rather be quiet. And she said to me that uh, uh, the students who are progressive right now very loudly now express even in the live group uh, or even on Twitter. But the student, the young generation, millennium who are uh, considered conservative now more quiet. But but at the same time, Generation X like my generation. The liberal, the pro, uh, the progressive—I mean, the majority—are rather quiet, but the conservative very loud. <laughs> it it rather go opposite. That the observation from uh, the young student I talked to her, and she said she disagree with her friend who are too progressive or too radical, but uh, she doesn't want to just to argue. But she disagree. <laughs> but but interesting. But pe people in Generation X maybe. They're quietly progressive, liberal, but they're rather quiet. The one who are more loudly, the, the, the conservative one, generation older. So do, so that's why you see the conflict between uh, liberal young and conservative olds. But maybe because the opposite, they are quiet majority. I don't know why. I'm not sure true or not, but that's another observation. Interesting observation. Uh, are there any other questions? Oh, so many questions. Yes, here, yeah, please. Uh, um, what might be the first step be for teachers who want to help learners develop their digital literacy? You wanted to take practice off learning, for example. How would you go about that? <laughs> A top but very important question because many NGOs try to campaign that we should put curriculum for digital literacy, MLDI that just mentioned by the Thai Media Fund or Digital Intelligence, but you need teacher, right? 
but in Thailand right now, <laughs> student movement fight against that teacher uh, nationwide uh, because uh, and and uh, the the student movement call themselves bad student movement, and they are considered like uh, pro, uh, aggressive and. People think that they produce many hate speech and they hate speech against their teachers and even digital minister. So, <laughs> yes, you need uh, digital intelligence in school, but the student question about the ability of their own teacher and our educational system, which I think, yeah, rather one of the most um, uh, things that difficult to reform. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to answer you. Yes, we should have curriculum. We should have that in school, but we have problem in school right now, and that's the the basic place that we need to fix. But who should fix it? I think we are running in circle. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> yes, but maybe we need civil society. Maybe we have to build up imaginary community uh, to help our uh, uh, us uh, to be. Uh, literate or literacy or intelligent rather than rely it uh, only in school or in in, in or a formal education that I would think of right now until we could really transform or reform the edu educational system in Thailand which the most one of the most difficult uh, uh, mission in this country thank you very much and over there was one more question yeah yeah Normally, uh, when I, it's very difficult, but when I work as an MBTC commissioner, as a regulator, I have to make a decision many times. And in many cases, I don't think it's considered hate speech, it's just political uh, expression against the government, government uh, performance. But I will make a decision that it's wrong and it could be under hate speech when those uh, TV content involving insulting uh, human dignity or, uh, involving racism, uh, involving uh, gender discrimination. Uh, there, there are many a lot in uh, variety TV or soap opera. Uh, so many times I also agree to sanction some TV consent that gone beyond that. So I think the line should be the universal idea of human rights. As long as those speech, even though sometimes it use strong words, but it criticized the public uh, figures based on their performance that should be acceptable. But when it go beyond the line, like uh, against the how you look or how rest you are or how gender you are, uh, that should be uh, uh, crossing the line uh, against uh, human rights. So I think human rights uh, should be the line to draw between uh, free uh, speech and hate speech, but at the same, but at the same time, you need to be flexible. Sometimes it's not just only clear, so you need to brainstorm people from different sectors. So I would listen to the progressive and the conservative, the young and the older, and then we have to make a colla colla collective decision that should this one is not correct. And maybe when it's not correct, it's not correct during the particular time. Maybe in the past, it's okay. Uh, like uh, the TV content about uh, uh, allow a man uh, to show a love affection to the woman he loved by rape. That is uh, reflect to the Thai culture. When you watch many Thai series 30 years ago, uh, in order for Thai men to uh, express their love to the woman, they need to use force. I don't know why. And then literally, Thai woman will have to allow herself to belong to be with him because he forced her maybe because Thai culture told Thai woman that you should 
be flirting with the man. You should not love him easily. So it reflects in the Thai literature that woman has to be forced and then uh, she will love him. That uh, can be acceptable 30 years ago, but in this age, no one watching it and young generation criticizing it that against uh, uh, the concept of uh, human rights, uh, women rights, and it could be hate speech or incitement of violence, and it's not acceptable. So what I meant that, of course, we sh the line should be human right, universal uh, standard value, but at the same time, we have to be flexible, and we need uh, to have collaborative and collective approach in order to make a judgment. So one more question. Robin? So um, for both speakers, I'm just curious, the, uh, could you give some more examples, like specific examples of terms that are used that in today's context can be seen? as representing hate speech. Uh, I understand your point about context, absolutely. Um, but what, what specific terms, for example, what's in the intergenerational? Uh, what are the young people saying about their parents? And in that um, context, could you maybe give a translation? You mentioned the word uh, salim. So all of you foreigners, we don't, we don't have any idea what it means. Could you give a translation to that? If it's not too embarrassing for you, so. A day for it, <laughs> no. Uh, okay, like, um, okay, this is like a, a tricky thing to do. But yeah, no, because like, if I say something right now, like there's some derogatory terms, like, you know, that will be recorded, <laughs> and then it might be used or abused, but yeah. But um, let me like, you know, um, give you an example by not trying to like, you know, translate those terms too, because like, it's very difficult to, to translate into English. And I, um, for now, I, I'm not even sure that I can like, you know, um, correctly translate it from, from Thai to English because it needs like a, a, a lot of like, you know, explanations and maybe I can also like misunderstand. Um, but uh, let's get back to, um, so what I just said, like, you know, it's the Lu language is like very, it's like, you know, the language that is understood by, by, um, by, you know, people in a certain like generation, like, you know, the younger generation, I think, and they, they like, you know, are very fluent in using this language and, you know, and sometimes um, derogatory terms and um, dehumanizing terms can be hidden in, in this particular language too. So what I um, would say here is that, um, you know, it's, it's always it's always like slippery to to like you know define that okay this word like you know reflects like 100 percent like you know um like you know um, hate speech but i think that as i said we have to try to understand like you know um the the context and that will help us like you know um, better appreciate like what are the terms that are being articulated this time can be considered as like you know um hate speech term if you have follow uh, the Thai political context before there's yellow shirt and red shirt, like you said, red shirt is the anti-military, uh, pro-yellow shirt mean pro-military, pro-establishment, uh, and red shirt may be, they say, the pro-democracy. But uh, during the conflict, ongoing con conflict within this 10 year, there's the group that try to say that they are neutral, they are multicolor, and film is one of the Thai suite that have many colors. Uh, but at the same time, the progressive or the, the anti-military, they say that uh, you call them yourself uh, uh, laxi. Actually, they don't call uh, laxi, mean wear many colors, but actually you are yellow <laughs> uh, or, or something like that. But uh, they call slim because slim actually is the Thai suite that have many colors uh, to represent a group 
uh, the group of the political cluster that they said they are not yellow, they are not red, they are multicolor, they are open for everyone. But <laughs> the people who are in a red yellow think that no, you are just another form of yellow color, <laughs> and but you call yourself many color and slim. But actually, slim itself is nothing. It's simple word. It's just the name of the sweet. But when it being used in political context, it become politicized. It become multiply, amplify, and whatever, and and become uh, hate speech in a way. But it doesn't mean that it it hate speech itself. But yeah, but sometimes it could be hispy, but uh, you don't know how to do with it now because it's it's just maybe it's just slang. It's come and go. It come and go, but uh, but it's still there now for ten years. But maybe in the future it's gone, something like that. <clears throat> I mean that that's very interesting for me to hear because it seems to me now as an outsider listening to your discussion that so-called or what is considered by some people in Thailand as hate speech is like a very metaphorical language that is even coded and for me as a person from the west seems very harmless actually right uh, it, it's it sounds like it, it's not really violent or like asking for violent um, my question would be uh, Talking um, in Germany about hate speech, we talk more about something like um, putting it in a Thai context, like all the all those young folks, they should um, go onto the, uh, they, you should throw them in in the binge or something like this, right? Or you should erase them, or they should get out of the country, right? They are not Thai citizens. Uh, does something like that happen in Thailand too, or is it everything on that very like metaphorical poetic uh, level? Uh, we have uh, saying that too. Uh, the before the pro government called the dissident as a communist, right? Uh, this time they call nation hater. You think nation hater is hate speech or not? No. <laughs> In Germany, nation hater wouldn't be considered as as hate speech. Speech it would be kind of controversial, but not hate speech. But as we said already, it, you know, it always belongs in the in the context. And uh, because uh, in the past, uh, pro-government called the anti-government as a communist, but this day they call themselves as a nation hater, which is, could be considered hate speech in some context. But yeah, but how how serious we should handle it? Of course, we should not encourage them to call that. But but I think there's a debate. But but it's interesting that the dissident itself sometimes they also defend that we are not nation hater, we are. We just hate you. <laughs> we just hate Prime Minister. We just hate government, something like that. So it led to another debate, another debate among themselves. So that's why it reminds me about the idea of radical love, because of course, maybe you're allowed to hate something a little bit, but you should not hate everything. And hating a little bit should be allowed because people will want to express, but it should not gone too much. But there should be a limitation. Uh, SMS, the terminology or the words that being used, of course, uh, sometimes it could not political correct. Uh, you can allow it in a free society, but when it cross the line, that should be a punishment, but the punishment should not be criminalized unless it really aggressive uh, or across the line. Like in Germany, you have the uh, old wounds. Of course, you have to prevent that not to happen. Uh, you prevent like a pro-Nazi uh, expression or whatever. So in Thailand, we have to look at as well uh, what is considered crossing the line and no one should allow that. If we talk openly, uh, we can find a common ground, but now there's a common, no, a common ground because one side say that you should not criticize the establishment because it will lead to the chaos in the nation. But the other side, that that's freedom of expression, and then <laughs> debate continue, and you cannot know where to aim, you know. Uh, uh, so, so that's why every time when you debate about his feet in Thailand, it's always go in circle, uh, and you cannot find a common ground yet. Hopefully, we could reach uh, at some point in the future. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from the floor? No? Okay. Uh, 
uh, that could be uh, so-called hate speech against uh, Muslim community in the deep south sometime and the migrants worker, especially related to COVID-19. Of course, that should be considered our cautious because when it becomes to the international politics, it's always lead to violence or hate, uh, much more than local politics, né? Uh, like between borders. So we should be more aware when the hate speech involving race, religions, uh, uh, that that could be dangerous, like uh, what reproduce again Muslim in the deep south or uh, Rohingya or other migrant worker, like the COVID nineteen spread. It could come from the migrant worker or uh, sorry Muslim community it could be spread this and that. So uh, when the new uh, when the mass media put a headline uh, without cautious uh, caution enough, it could lead to a conflict. So my opinion, I think that should be more aware and should be concerned. And there should be a, a, a like a mechanism for the regulation among media or even among us to correct each other that is already crossing the line and that could lead to a real uh, violence. Yeah, any hate speech that could lead to the real violence should be considered uh, unacceptable, and we should find a solution to uh, to counter it. That's what my opinion. Okay, thank you very much. So if there are no open questions, then I would say we would close this panel and have a break.